He rules everything, but he doesn't reign everything. He takes charge of things concerning his church. Amen? Amen. It's a place of protection. It's a place of peace and love where God abides is in his church. Amen? You may be seated this morning. We're going to Psalms 65 and verse 5. If our morning temperatures can catch up with our evening temperatures, we'll be doing all right. Hey, man, it feels really good in the mornings. <clears throat> Psalm 65 and verse 5 through verse 7. <clears throat> By terrible things and righteousness wilt thou answer us, O God of our salvation, who art the, conf who art the confidence of all the ends of the earth, and them that are far off upon the sea, by which his strength settleth fast the mountains, being girded with power. Verse 7, which stilleth the noise of the seas, and the noise of their waves, and the tumult of people. Amen. Let's go over to uh, <clears throat> chapter 89 of Psalms, verse 8. Chapter 89 and verse 8. O Lord God of hosts, who is a strong Lord like unto thee, or to thy faithfulness round about thee. Verse 9, thou rulest the raging of the sea. When the waves thereof arise, thou stillest them. I hope you're getting a, a line here. God controls the storm. Mark chapter 4 and verse 35. <clears throat> There's some places you can get in life where you're just helpless. If you're old enough, you've been there. But there's no place you can get where God's not in control. If you're on a ship out in the ocean, and the ocean decides to get tumultuous, you're going to get full of fear. Because you can't control those waves. And they can get bigger and bigger and bigger until they become mountains around your boat. Amen? The other place you can be afraid is if you're in the air, and you ain't flying the plane, and you hit turbulence. And that thing decides to drop a few feet. Your, your stomach will leave you for just a moment. And even a good atheist would have to say a word of prayer in that time. Oh, Lord God, if thou be, take control of this plane. What I'm saying is whether you live for God or you don't, you're going to hit some tumultuous times in life. But you've got to understand there's someone who controls the storm. Whether he stops it or doesn't stop it, he still controls it. And if he don't stop it, say, Lord, what am I supposed to learn out of this? Amen? Mark chapter 4 and verse 35. And the same day when the even was come, he saith unto them, his disciples, let us pass over. Don't change this verse just yet. Let us pass over unto the other side. Jesus said, we're going to get in the boat and we're going to go to the other side. All right? He had, they had a word from God, and when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was. Remember that. They took him. They took Jesus even as he was in the ship. That's a funny way of saying Jesus got in the boat. You'll see why here in a moment. They took him even as he was in the ship. And there were also with him other little ships because the crowd's trying to follow him. And there arose a great storm of wind. I bet you the crowds left when the storm arrived. But the disciples of that day, they were, they were climatologists because you didn't have weathermen in that day. If you was a fisherman, you had to know how to read the weather yourself. They, kinda, they probably realized there's not good weather ahead of us, but the Lord said for us to get in the boat and go to the other side. And the other little boats wanted to follow them, but at some point, I got a feeling those guys said, these guys are crazy. Let's go back home. What are they trying to do? They're going right into a storm, and there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. And he was, and Jesus was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. Thank God they had pillows back in them days. You go back far enough, a pillow was a stone. So we've come a long ways. Amen. Jacob slept with a pillow as his stone. I don't know how well he rested that night. 
He had a dream of angels going up and down the way. Uh, thank God he knew it was God because I thought this dumb pillow doesn't give me nightmares. Asleep on a pillow and they awake him, woke Jesus up and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, his disciples, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? Verse 44, 41, and they feared exceedingly. They were more afraid after he calmed the storm than they were of the storm. Because they had never seen Jesus the way they're fixing to see Jesus. They feared exceedingly and said one to another, what manner of man is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? What a mighty God we serve. No matter what storm you're in, don't be terrified because the master of the storm is Jesus. If he allows the storm, you're going to be all right. If he's on your boat, you're fine. If he stops the storm, wonder if he don't, you'll be fine still. He's the master of the storm. 1 Timothy 3 and 16. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. <clears throat> says this, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. And it explains right here. That's why there's a colon right here in your Bible, like a dictionary. It has a colon right there. It's going to explain what that first part means. And here it is. God was manifest in the flesh. Wasn't part of God, wasn't some of God, wasn't one person of God. It was just God. Everything that is God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit. What that means was the spirit of God proved and validified that he was in Christ by miracles, signs, and wonders. Justified in the Spirit. When Jesus said, peace be still, and the waves and the winds obeyed him, that meant I am God. Justified in the Spirit, seen of angels. No one has seen God, nor can see God. But the Bible says angels have seen him. How? Because when he was manifesting the flesh, they saw the image of the invisible God. Seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, that was Jesus, believed on in the world and received up into glory. And that is our God. One more reading this morning, Nahum, Nahum chapter 1 and verse 3. Nahum chapter 1 verse 3. <clears throat> the Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. In other words, you're not going to get away with anything unless somebody else pays your debts. And that's what Jesus came to do, pay our debts. The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm and the clouds are the dust of his feet. Every storm God controls. He has his way in storms. Now, not all storms come for the same reason. You've heard people say, you know, there's a reason for everything. But sometimes the reason is just I'm stupid and I made a dumb decision. That sometimes is the reason. Well, dumb me. I created a mess for myself. Amen. There's storms that are going to come. Sometimes it's because God is redirecting our lives. God will send a storm. Sometimes it's because Satan is trying to get us off a course. A storm will come. But God controls all storms, whether it's because of our ignorance, because of God's desire, or because of the, the Satan's trying to destroy us. Whatever it might be, yet God still controls every storm. It was a pretty full day that day that we read about in Mark where Jesus calmed the storm. By the time dusk was dawning, Jesus was back on the shore with the multitudes that evening. He had a long day. Several chapters of that had happened that day in your Bible. He asked his disciples to take him over to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Sleep, that blessed place of sleep. If you have trouble sleeping, I feel for you. Thank God that I can just, I could probably kick my head over on this uh, pul pulpit right now and go to sleep. Because me and sleep are close friends. We love each other. Amen. Sleep, that blessed state, that uh, har a harbor for the tired of body. And at evening time, Jesus was tired. And sleep was probably heavy on his mind. And the Bible says, as I read to you this morning, the disciples took Jesus, Jesus even as he was in the ship. This means Jesus was sleeping before he was taken into 
the ship. He was so tired, he was overcome with weariness and must have just laid down somewhere and said, boys, get us to the other side of this sea. By the time I get up, I'm going to take a nap. And that, that entire day had been taken up with Jesus working and serving and healing and casting out devils. And now he was weary and tired. And at the end of the day, he no longer worked, but now he wanted to sleep. The picture is almost maternal. I remember as, as my babies were children, they'd fall asleep here, there, or yonder. Wouldn't wake them up. you just pick them up and throw them over your shoulder like a sack of potatoes and carry them to the car and lay them out. They wouldn't wake up. They wouldn't wake up till the next morning. You could thump them in the head and they wouldn't wake up. they just gone. Mama's like, don't wake them up. I said, don't wake them up. I don't think you could wake them up. It's like they had a dose of Benadryl. They were gone, man. But you'd throw them over your shoulder and you'd carry them to the car. You remember that. Parents remember those days. Pick them babies up and carry them out and they were out of it. And one fisherman called to the other fisherman asking for help. Help me out. He said, take his arms and I'll get his feet. And one said, now don't wake him up. He's, he's tired. Let him rest. Hold his head. Good. Now, let's lay him back carefully right here. Now, John, grab that pillow over there from Dad's boat and put that pillow under his head where he can rest good. He's had a long, hard day of work. And so we find Jesus asleep in a boat in the middle of the storm. They tenderly laid his head upon the pillow and covered him, per se, with a blanket. Away they sailed across the darkening water. He told them, boys, y'all get us to the other side of this sea. I don't know if they realized it or not. Maybe they did because they were fishermen by trade. They probably knew how to read the weather pretty good. And maybe one looked out and said, mm, number of red clouds over there. This is not a good day to be going across the sea, especially in the middle of the night. The other one said, yeah, but Jesus said Let's go across the sea. So we're going across the sea whether we want to or not. We're not waiting for a better day. We're not going to ask him tomorrow if we should or shouldn't do it. Get him in the boat. Let's go. We're going across the sea. And so they set out in the darkness of the night on those waters. And Jesus slept. He was unbothered by the storm that he knew was coming. But most likely Jesus slept because he was bone tired. He was so tired that even the tempest could not awaken him from his sleep. When the boat was full of water and tossed about like a rag on the sea, the Bible says they had to wake him up. You know you're asleep good when a storm like that won't wake you up. He was bone tired and he was sound asleep in the back of the boat. And they were fighting for their life trying to survive a storm. The day leading up to Jesus calming the stormy sea, the day was so full that it ended with Jesus falling into a deep, deep sleep on a pillow the disciples had put under his head that day, on that day in your Bible. Needy men and women surrounded him, touching him, begging him, and brought their children to him, and he wrestled with demons for men's souls, and he, he, for his troubles, he was accused of being in a league with devils that day, and he blessed the broken and cleansed the leper and healed Peter's mother-in-law that day and he healed the paralytic that day and listened to all the centurion had to say and, and he healed the man's servant that day and Jesus climbed into, into a small mountain that day. And on that small mountain he said, boys, I'm tired. Get the boat ready. We're going to the other side. That should have been enough right there. I think that's why he said when he woke up, why you guys have such small faith? Didn't you hear me say, let's go to the other Amen. side? Yes. When you're standing on the word of God, you've got nothing to fear. Come on. Come on. Now there's a fine line between the word and foolishness. But if you're on the word of God, you have nothing to fear because God's word is a solid foundation that cannot fail. He withstood the withering doubt of his own brothers, blood brothers on that day. Before he ever, ever sailed up on that sea that evening, he had already spent a day in deep, deep humanity. The sea of people, the waves of diseases, the testing of demonic spirits, and a thousand hands reaching out to him on that day, clawing at him, begging from him on that day. They pushed him and pulled in every direction. At one point, the crowds were so dense and drew up so close that Jesus was backed into the shore of Galilee. 
right up to the edge of the water and out of, out of space and needing to spend time still teaching. He had to get a little boat from one of the fishermen there and he pushed off from the shore a little ways that he might have a separation between him and the crowds where they could hear him and he could teach them. And after he was done speaking and the evening was near, he found that his work was still not done. His disciples were puzzled by some of his parables and so they pulled him aside and the wearied master begins to answer their questions about the parables that he taught on that day. But this time with his, with his disciples he gives detailed commentary about the parables that he had told the multitude. And so he's wearied. And now you kind of get an understanding of why he's so tired that day. Before we watch Jesus rise up out of his sleep and calm the storms, we should consider the sea very carefully. You see, the Israelites tended to fear the sea and avoid it as much as possible. In their day and time, they didn't have airplanes. They couldn't fly from point A to point B, but they did have boats. And so for them, there was nothing more treacherous or fearful than getting out in the midst of the sea. They didn't have motors. All they had was oars and sails. So you better know what you're doing if you get into something that's called a sea. This wasn't a stream, this wasn't a creek, this wasn't a pond. This thing was called a sea. You get in the middle of the sea, you can't see bank in any direction. You're basically at the whims of the wind and the waves. And so the Israelites feared anything that was called the sea, and they would avoid it. To some degree, the sea seemed to resist the orderliness of creation. For at a moment's notice, that I've been out, I've been out in my in my boat, especially my Peter. I had a Peter as a young man. I'd go out bass fishing and had a trolling motor on the front and a foot pedal to control it. And I'd get out there and I'd be bass fishing away, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, would come a storm. As you know, them weathermen ain't but like ten percent right. That ain't but 10% of the time. You do the math. You better bring an umbrella is all I got to tell you. Hey, man. But I'd be out there fishing away and all of a sudden I'd realize, man, that's a bad looking storm coming. Then I'd hear lightning. Boy, when you hear lightning, I'm done. I was like, put it down. We're going home. Getting off the water. Lightning and the water don't go good together. Not when you're on top of them. And me and my little Pete Rowe, we were going, you know, just as fast as we could go. And I'd be cupping water with my hand trying to help that baby out because that battery's about dead after fishing all day. And we're just poking along and them waves start getting bigger and bigger. And all of a sudden, they're kind of coming over the front of the Pete Rowe. You get kind of panicked. You start thinking about what could actually happen out here in this river, this water I've fished so many times. But I could see the banks. Can you imagine being out in the ocean? There's no way out. You're at the mercy of that storm. And so those Jews would be terrified of those kinds. I've been in a, another time. We was in a, a, a big old boat one time, me and my brother on Cross Lake in Shreveport. We were on the far end of Cross Lake when a storm came up. And, man, that thing went from pretty slightly choppy waters to big old huge waves just in a few minutes of time. And instead of pulling back into the trees and just waiting it out, my brother said, we're going to the bank. Well, that's across the river, probably three or four miles. And this is the way my brother did it. He just laid the hammer down. Boom, and we was in the V-hull boat, and we were going through waves. Boom, boom, boom. We was hitting the tops of them. I was just a little teenage boy. I was terrified out of my ever-loving mind. I could feel him holding my back, holding me down in that boat so I didn't fly out. But we was just hitting the tops of them waves and choo! he was terrified too, I'm sure. Storms are terrible. Storms terrify. Not all storms are winds and waves. You're going to meet storms that have nothing to do with water. But they're still terrible. And they still terrify you. And they still test your faith and try your faith. You got to look up and say, Lord, I don't know how to do this. But I do know you are in control of this mess. And my hope is in you. That you control the storms that I'm going to go through. I want you to notice in our reading today, the devil did not send these disciples into the storm. The disciples did not want to go into the storm. It was Jesus who said, boys, get in the boat and go to the other side. What are you going to do, Lord? Are you going to be out on the front? 
guiding it. No, no, no. I'm going to go back in the back of the boat and I'm going to go to sleep. Now, come on, Lord. Can't you get on the front and like say, okay, boys, go that way a little bit, then just jump over there and get all right, up, up with the sails. Come on, Lord. Can't you just kind of like be the captain and let us kind of know you're in? No, nope, I'm going to go to sleep. And I've been in storms in my life when I said, God, where are you? How did I get in this mess? I was trying to do right. And now I've got a mess on my hands. And I'm like, I can't even find you, God. Where are you at? Job, when he lost his health and he lost his wealth and he lost his kids, he said, I'm looking for God. He said, I look behind me and he's not there. I look on the right and I can't find him. I look on the left and I can't find him. In front and I can't find him. He said, I've looked everywhere for God and I can't find him. But then he said this, but he knows the way I take. When I don't know where he's at, I can rest assured. He knows exactly where I'm at. And then Job said this, when he hath tried me, not when Satan has tried me, when he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. He said, I'm not going to lose my integrity in the storm. I'm not going to let this storm destroy me. I'm not going to quit and throw in the towel. I'm going to just keep trusting God and keep doing what I know to do. And God will make a way somehow. I'm just a boat out here on the sea, tall side to side. I'm thinking, Lord, if you, I wish you to come yesterday. We could have avoided this mess. I wish you'd have said something yesterday, Lord. Maybe I could have. But here I am. I'm a wreck. But when you're a wreck, you got to find the person who knows and controls the storm. And we are so fortunate to know who that is. Jesus controls the storm. We look in our Bible when those Israelites were terrified of storms. Yes, there were some fishermen. That's all the more reason they had to know how to read the weather. Because they were terrified of those storms. The apocalyptic beast in Revelations is said to rise out of the sea as if to indicate the beast is empowered by Satan to bring chaos to the waves of the ocean. And then John wrote in his book, of the symbolism that surrounds God's throne. He describes it like this. He said, there's a sea around God's throne, but he describes it like this. It's a sea like glass. In other words, there's no tumultuous, there's no problems. Everything is placid and peaceful around God's throne. And when you come to God, you got to understand, you may come full of terror, full of fear, full of angst, but you're not going to ever get God terrified Fearful or anxious because he controls the storm. Don't get mad at God if you're having a pity party and he won't join you. Remember, you and God are not the same. Often I start my prayers with this, Lord, I'm dust and you're deity. And I realize, acknowledge the difference between me and you. I'm weak and you're strong. I'm nothing and you're everything. That's why I'm here in need of you today. Because I don't know what to do even when I think I know what to do. I don't know what to do. But at least I know this much. I know who I need to go to. And that's you. I know the master of the wind. I know the maker of the waves. I know the one who can calm the sea at just any moment he wants to. And if he don't calm the sea, I at least want to leave that prayer meeting know, knowing that he's in my boat. Just let me know you're with me, Lord. That'll be good enough. If the storm's not going to stop, I just want to feel your presence and know that you are still with me. Sometimes that's enough. 
just to feel his presence because in his presence there's fullness of joy at his right hand there's pleasures forever more the presence of God brings peace and brings strength and brings hope and sometimes that's all you get I hate to tell you like this but it's the truth God's not going to stop every storm this is a wonderful chapter we read today about how Jesus got up and said peace be still he can do that but he don't always do that sometimes he's just present he's a very present help in the time of troubles but he's not always a remover of the troubles sometimes the troubles were sent by him to help us grow help us learn help us make better decisions in life but around that throne of God is a sea of glass there's no chaos or disorder no disharmony where God rules in his faithfulness the sea on which Jesus and his disciples sailed was not a figurative sea it was a sea of Galilee that day and a modest sized lake really the Jewish people were more willing to sail and fish on a body of water this size even then they were fearful of what can happen at the sea because you got to realize in that day and time if Joe don't come back from fishing a few days go by ain't no National Guard going to look for Joe he's just gone what happened he went fishing Ain't like you, Brother Mix. You got a big old Evan Rude motor on the back of that boat. You can get across there pretty fast. But if all you got is a sail and oars, you better not even go in that sea. Fishermen generally knew when and when not to sail. No doubt they had seen the signs, but Jesus told them, Boys, take me to the other side. They must have believed it would be okay since Jesus knew all things and they did not but once the storm arose and tossed their small ship around they thought their moments were numbered and their days were doomed and here they were with Jesus and he said let's go to the other side and they they are convinced they are so convinced they're going to die they woke him up and said don't you even care that we perish That's a good thing, though. They finally reached the end of their abilities. Their boat's full of water. They said, it's over, guys. All we can do is get to Jesus. That's where we mess up sometimes. We do everything we can do. And finally, when we reach the end of what we can do, we go get Jesus. Let me help you here. Get him first. At the first sign of problems, run to him first. Just say, Lord, I want you to know what's going on. And, and I know you know, but I want you to, to be with me in this and help me make the right decisions. You know, you, you know you're really smart. And I think adults get to this place. I'm starting to get there when I finally realize how dumb I am. When you're a teenager, you're too dumb to know how dumb you are. I hate that for the teenagers, but I've been through teenage years. But as you get older, all of a sudden you realize, man, my mom and dad were brilliant. And now I'm, the older I get, the more I don't know. And I start, that's true wisdom. When you realize how you don't know a lot of stuff. That's the more you need Jesus. <laughs> The sea on which Jesus and his disciples sailed was not a figurative sea, but it was real that day. And those fishermen probably looked at the water and looked at the winds, and, but then Jesus said, let's go, boys, get me across the other side. What are you going to do, Lord? I'm going to go to sleep. One, one disciple pulled the sails. Another used buckets to bucket out water. Yet another grabbed an oar and tried to keep the boat Facing the waves. You, dare, you don't want to get sideways with the waves. They shouted, but the thunder and the wind and the heavy rain ground out their voices. Strobes of lightning shot across the sky like bony fingers and lit up the seas in the middle of the night. The white blue flat light flashed into the panicked faces of those in that boat as the waves mounted over their heads on all sides. It was loom, it was gloom, it was doom. 
So much so that I bet somebody must have thought, where is the Lord? The disciple waited for the next flash of lightning to look around and he saw the master there asleep in the hinder part of the ship. He's still asleep, boys. We're fighting for our lives. The desperate disciple crawled back to where the Lord was and shook him awake. He had to shake him awake. Master, carest thou not that we perish? Yeah, Jesus cared. And they weren't going to perish. How do you know? Because he said, get in the boat. We're going to the other side. There wasn't enough water in that sea to bring that boat down. Because that boat wasn't floating on the sea, it was floating on the word. And you can't sink the word of God. But you can sure feel like you're sinking. Carest thou not that we perish? And Jesus awakened. Jesus lifted his head off that pillow, stood to his feet, and he said three words. Three words. Peace. Be still. Some have said, I don't know. He didn't stay storm, be still. He said, peace. Be still. Maybe the storm had a name. I don't know. But when he said three words, whew, everything went placid. The sea was glass. The wind was gone. Just three words. It doesn't take God a lot. I know we professional Pentecostals sometimes think the louder and the longer we pray, the more we accomplish. Maybe sometimes, I don't know, but I think it's just a matter of faith. I think the frailest saint of God who can hardly get a hand in the air can whisper us a few words in faith and move heaven and earth. It's the level of our faith, not the level of our voice. That moves God. I tell you, and I've been in Pentecost all my life, but I'm I'm now of the opinion, and maybe a wrong opinion, but I think sometimes we raise our voice because we don't have no faith. We get loud because we're trying to convince us. You gotta have faith. Faith, 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 just a little bit of faith. You don't need a whole lot. Just use what you got. It takes, it takes quite a bit of faith to realize you don't have much faith peace be still Jesus raised the dead with three words Lazarus come forth it don't take long prayers it just takes faith the disciples had seen leprosy retreat from sick bodies in the Lord's ministry before the storm they had seen demons cast out of men's souls at the words of Jesus. But who in the world controls the winds and the waves? You see, the Old Testament I read to you today said the Lord controls the winds and the waves. And these disciples knew these Old Testament scriptures that there wasn't but one who controls the winds and the waves. And where is the switch in nature that turns on a storm or turns off a storm? And who has access to it? And that's why they were terrified. They were terrified of the storm, but when it all went calm, they were even they were exceedingly fearful, the Bible says. They looked at one another and said, Oh my goodness. He said he was God, he acted like God, but he just proved. On the Sea of Galilee, suddenly the storm stopped. The storm ceased, and the three short words that Jesus spoke moments earlier. Waves threatened the men. But those self-same waves now tumbled prostrate before the Lord as they cradled the boat in kindness. And the disciples' eyes turned to one another and then back to the Master. It slowly dawned on them that the Christ with them in the boat was far more powerful and more fearful than the storm that had just surrounded them. I'm reminded of the, the old prophet in the Bible. And the enemy's coming to get the preacher. The preacher's been telling, uh, the, the, been telling the Israelites what the enemy's plans are. 
the, the uh, Sumerians, I believe, have been telling the uh, Israelites, kings, what the plans are. So they decide they're going to come get the preacher who's been telling their plans. And so they come at night and they come with a big old army full of people for one man, one preacher. They're going to sneak up on him. He's been telling what their plans are. They're going to sneak up on him. You don't sneak up on God. And they come, they get around that city where the man of God is, and his servant goes out. He says, alas, master, he said, look, come here, master. Look, on all sides, we're surrounded by the enemy armies. And that old preacher said, Lord, open his eyes that he might see. And so that servant blinks his eyes, and next time he opens his eyes, he sees the army of fire surrounding the enemy army. On all sides. God is with us. Whatever's threatening us is under his feet. Whatever wants to destroy us is at his command. No wicked shall befall thee, except the Lord has a plan in it. He controls it all. What a good God to serve. What a great reason to serve the Lord. Is that I have one who controls everything. I'd rather lose everything than lose him. He controls it all. And they said, what manner of man is this? That even the wind and the seas obey him. They knew Jesus was a man. They had just watched him spend himself like a man in ministry. They had carried his unresponsive body into a boat and there placed his head on a pillow. I mean, who gets tired? Not God. The Bible says of God, he neither slumbers nor sleepeth. That's why you can go to sleep at night. God's on duty. He never goes off shift. He's always there and he's always watching for those who love him. So next time the devil slips up on your night and says, boo, I'm going to get you tonight. Say, devil, you know God's here. You'll scare the devil out of him. God neither slumbers nor sleeps. So you can get a good night's rest. He's always on the job. <clears throat> and they knew Jesus. And this is so important in our Bible because Jesus was two things. He was fully man and he was fully God. It's called the incarnation. It's beyond our understanding, but it's not beyond our acknowledgement. He was fully man. In other words, Jesus could do everything a man could do. Jesus could sin if he wanted to, but he didn't want to and he never sinned. But he was tempted in all ways like as we, yet without sin. But he was tempted, and the Bible says God cannot be tempted. But Jesus was tempted. As a man, he was tempted to sin. As a man, he got tired. As a man, he wept at Lazarus' funeral, that Lazarus had died. As a man, he wept. But as God, he stood up and said, Lazarus, come forth. That's why when you read your Bible, you got to be careful when it comes to Jesus. Because he may be acting as a man, or he may be acting as God in any situation, because he was both. But he never used his deity to bypass or overcome his humanity. But yet he was fully man and fully God. That's why in our reading, Jesus grew tired and fell asleep. That was as a man. I mean, listen to me. If you're going to look for somebody to help you, is it going to be the guy you just had to carry on the boat because he was so tired? Like, what's that weary guy going to do for us? He's wore out. That shows his humanity. He carried him onto the boat where he slept. Psalms 107 Taught them that God, not a man, calms the seas. And so when Jesus calmed the seas, he was no longer just a tired man. He was God in their presence. Gospel accounts such as Mark take uh, pain to declare that Jesus' humanity was true humanity. There are some false doctrines in our world that John fought with, even his book back in the writing of the, of the scriptures, that taught that God was, that Jesus was simply all God who looked like a man. That's not true. He was fully man. 
Others taught that he was fully man who was just a good preacher, a good prophet, but he wasn't really God. That's not true either. Jesus was fully man and fully God. Now, his humanity is different than our humanity in this, in this wise. We were born under sin because we're born under the first Adam. And sin passed down to all of us through the first Adam. But Jesus was not born of an earthly father. He was a second act of God. Where God created a human being just like every other human being. But God created a last Adam. That's why Jesus is called the last Adam in your Bible. He's not called the second Adam because there is no more Adams. There's two Adams in your Bible. The first Adam, which we all come under that. And then there's the last Adam, which is Jesus Christ. Again, God birthed him. So we're born our first time at, with an earthly father called Adam that passes sin on to us. And that's why Jesus said, marvel not that I say unto you, you must be born again. Well, who's my father in the second birth? God. When I receive the Holy Ghost, it is Christ in me. It is God in me. I'm born of a heavenly father. Jesus was fully God and fully man. I hope I made sense with that. Gospel accounts tell us that these, these great truths, that his, de his deity was true deity, his humanity was true humanity. Even after the resurrection, you think about it now, the uh, disciples are hiding in the room and they're eating fish and eating whatever and they're hiding, they're afraid because Jesus died and Jesus appears in the midst of their room. And there's some fish on the table. He said, I think I'll have a piece of that. That looks pretty good. You boy did a good job. He ate the fish. Now, wait a minute. Did he walk through a wall? As God, he appeared. And then as a glorified body, he ate a fish. How, do you, how does a ghost digest a fish? I'm always wondering, could you see the fish go down? And because he could act in both ways. That's why some people get off into Trinity and false doctrine. They're thinking that when Jesus talked to the Father, it was one person of God talking to another person. God. No, no, not at all. The Father was in Christ and the Father was in heaven because the Father is an omnipresent spirit that fills the whole universe. There's nowhere you can, you can go that God's not. And when Jesus said, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father, then he turned and said, my Father which is in heaven. Now where is he at? Both. There's one God, he's manifest in one body, even the man Jesus Christ. The incarnation was God in character. The humanity of Jesus Christ did not hide God, it really revealed God. The incarnation gave God a body that was capable of suffering uniquely physical pain. And there, and there are the pains that transcend the body that even God felt in the flesh. That's why we can go to him and he can bear our burdens because he has felt them as a man. I can't explain the incarnation, but I completely believe the incarnation. Jesus wept, not just because he had physical tears. He wept because God has always wept. It was the sin of man that caused God to go to the Calvary. His desire to save us has always been there. The flesh of God was not a veil hiding God's existence or his essence. Instead, God's incarnation flesh was a window through which we could see clearly the fullness of God. In the Old Testament, we saw the anger of God against sin and the hatred of God against sin. But in the New Testament, we see the tears of God in redemption as he reaches out to us. And desires to cover us and save us. The incarnation shows us God's most complete self. It's kind of like this. If I can put it in terms we can understand. When a loving father whips his child. He has to whip his child. He whips his child because he loves his child. But if it's truly a loving father. When he gets through whipping his child. He himself feels pain. He himself questions himself, could I have done something different? Could I have set up, built a new barrier or done something to refrain or maybe take them away from that situation? Or So it is with God. 
Calvary was the real love of God to us. He hated what we had done, but he loved us so much that he robed himself in flesh and went through all of this that he might redeem us back. We've been entrusted with the apostles' accounts of Jesus. In these accounts, Jesus clearly suffered the weakness of humanity, but also clearly worked as the deity of God. And that one reading shows it so clearly. So tired, he falls asleep. So God, he wakes up to speak to the storm. The clash of human frailty and the divine omnipotence were weaved together in Christ Jesus. Mark framed the calming of the sea with Jesus' human weariness first. So tired, the disciples had to lift up his limp body and help him to the boat. They had just carried him asleep onto that boat. And then they face the storm. And they wake up the wearied man on their boat only to then realize what manner of man is this? What could that man do that just collapsed before them? i tell you what he can do. He can speak to any storm and say, peace, be still. Let's stand.